welcome back. We continue with the third presentation of Jorge Ponce, Head of Economic Research at the Central Bank of Uruguay on financial stability through the lens of historical economics. Mr. Ponce, the floor is yours. Good afternoon and thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here in this uh, beautiful country, beautiful city, beautiful people. Thank you very much for that. I will talk about financial stability through the lens of historical economics after lunch, so I hope you get enough coffee for, for this presentation. So the first question that, that came to my mind is, can historical economics help today financial stability efforts? Because today we are in a digital era, era where cybersecurity, privacy, data protection are at the core of the thing. We talk about cryptocurrencies like the Bitcoin, blockchain, fintech, big techs, payment systems, and the promise to decentralize and democratize finance. It is also new habits after the pandemic on people. Uh, we talk about stable coins today with the promise to provide stability and efficiency in payments, also to decentralize finance. And also we saw the reaction of central banks through CBDC, central bank digital currencies, and phase pa fast payment systems. And of course, we are in the era of in artificial intelligence with the promise to bring efficiency to, 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 to everyday things. So the question is, how can a tulip inform today's financial stability developments? Or what happens inside a building in the 17th century in Amsterdam? Or the endeavors of a guy, of a guy born in Scotland, sentenced to death after killing in duel, who escaped to France, who was described as tall, handsome and vain with passion for women and gambling, that became the governor of the Central Bank of France in 1720. So one thing is historical common sense. Uh, we have to take into account that the ratio of death to alive people is 14 to 1. So, so some past experiences might be useful and some past ideas might seem out of date, but may, might also help to understand the fundamental reasons behind financial stability or instability. At least those who do not know their history are doomed to repeat their mistakes. And a lot of knowledge has been accumulated over the previous 200 years, as the Google Ngrams shows in particular, more and more on financial crisis and financial stability. But because this is history that ask artificial intelligence for an answer, and in the, in the, uh, artificial intelligence says yes, yes. Historical economic that helps today financial stability effort by providing valuable insights into the evolution of financial system, the drivers of financial crisis, the effectiveness of policies and regulation, and then understanding historical patterns allows policymakers and financial practitioners to identify trends, anticipate potential risk, and develop appropriate responses. And in my opinion, artificial intelligence is too optimistic. I recognize the usefulness of historical economics, but also acknowledge the limitation of it. Of course, problems emerge and manifest in different and changing ways, as the quote by uh, Tolstoy anticipate us. Happy families are all alike, but every unhappy family, every financial trouble is unhappy in its own way. Still, studying the fundamentals behind unhappy, unhappy events from the past might be very useful to focus current assessment efforts and better anticipate problems. So let me start with uh, three examples, three past events, 
and uh, relate them to today's problems or today's uh, manifestation of systemic risk. One is back to Amsterdam in the 17th century, and it's called tulip mania. Maybe you have uh, listened about it. Uh, let's start about what is a tulip is. A tulip is a beautiful flower. I saw some tulips yesterday in the uh, Budapest uh, Zoo. Uh, beautiful flowers, but it's very, very difficult to make a lot of tulips from just one tulip. It takes between seven and 12 years to give a flower. And today, a tulip, a tulip bulb, costs uh, between 50 cents and two US dollars. But was not the case in Amsterdam. In 1636, uh, in Amsterdam, the price of bulb skyrockets. What happens in Amsterdam? It was a fruitful territory. It was uh, a lot of uh, wealthy people over there, and the bulbs of uh, tulips were saw as a symbol of status in the society. And of course, when the market became popular, a lot of other people, tell them speculators, enter the market. So the price of a bulb of tulip in Amsterdam at that time was equivalent to five acres of prime land or a house in Amsterdam. This is a lot of money for a single uh, tulip bulb. And in addition to that, the bulbs didn't exist in real life. People put money and assets on a piece of paper, a piece of paper which promised to deliver a tulip bulb in the upcoming spring. Um, people believe that the price will keep rising and making all sorts of investment in the expectation of greater returns, something that we could uh, call today overconfidence. And this is a behavioral uh, bias uh, that uh, generates, together with the prolific territory of wealthy people, a lot of money around, a classical feedback look. Price appreciation breeds further rises on prices. And this is the graph of the price of tulips, a typical boom and boost cycle, a bubble, let's say, and the party collapses when no more, no more money was invested. Some investor call their money back, and this le leads to a sudden and collective rush toward toward the exist. And of course, in this case, the market euphoria or mania uh, came from these uh, behavioral bias, uh, biases, but also could come from technological developments and financial inventions. <clears throat> and this is back in history. Come to today's days, what about Bitcoin? Like uh, tulip bulls, Bitcoin is hard to reproduce, never beautify a house, and is a promise to be redeemed, redeemed in cash. And when I prepared the slide, it was 72,000, the price of a Bitcoin today is 66, something, something like that, which is not the price of a house in Amsterdam, but the price of an apartment in Montevideo, Uruguay. So, in my opinion, this is a bubble. This is something uh, we should take care about. And sometimes bubbles only burst after a certain period, but uh, if something cannot go forever, it will stop in some moment. Tulips is a case of a boom and bust cycle uh, because of overconfidence. Let's talk a little bit about technology now, because we listen about technology, about blockchain, about a lot of things. And to do that, let's refer to the case of the Bank of Amsterdam, which in some sense could be understood as an early stablecoin. And in that sense, the concept of a stablecoin and the solvency 
of a central bank are not new, and so the technology behind them uh, are of second order or uh, magnitude of importance in the case of uh, financial stability. Money, at the end of the day, is a social convention. Anything could serve as money, provided that this convention is satisfied in equilibrium. So the question is whether or not stable coins can be sustained in equilibrium. So let's go to the, to the case of the, the Bank of Amsterdam. Was established to provide monetary exchange at fixed rate and became a wholesale deposit bank backed by silver and gold coins. They introduced the book entry system, which allows to uh, make some kind of payment system, uh, a wholesale uh, settled payments uh, between their customers. Uh, importantly, uh, the reserves fully cover the notes issued by the bank and was invulnerable to major panics during a lot of time. This is a kind of rigid stable coin in which no credit operations are involved. It's just reserve, fully covered uh, bank notes. Okay, it was very stable but inefficient for the time because the merchants in Amsterdam received the ships with some delay, some period of time, which was uh, longer, less, less frequent than uh, the payments they have to do. So this uh, uh, rigid stable coin was poorly sweet as a foundation for the modern monetary system, the system of the time, the uh, 18th, 17th century. So the bank started to make some lending and credit operations start to uh, become a settlement liquidity provider by providing overdraft to certain customers and to allow the redemption uh, by deposits through what they call receipts, something like modern repos operations. So this is some kind of uh, elastic stable coin where the central role in supporting the economy was very important, and they do, the Bank of Amsterdam, sorry, did it for a long time. Uh, but the value now was sustained by, by trust, by trust in the unit of account, by trust on the bank itself, on the complete balance sheet, both sides of the balance sheet of the Bank of Amsterdam. And this was possible because the trust was accumulated through years and this confidence was built through years. It takes long, but could be destroyed quickly, as we'll see. we'll see. This kind of stable coin, the question is, was it stable? Well, what happens was that uh, during a war, a massive loans start to be given by the bank in particular to the Dutch East Indian Company and also to the city of Amsterdam, uh, and also the scene was with the, the war with the economic downturn, which in some sense eroded confidence, and massive defaults start, and then a series of runs deplete the bank reserves. Bank reserves that were not enough when the bank uh, of Amsterdam fails, only one third of the coin were backed by silver and gold. You have to remember that the bank starts lending a lot, concentrating risk at the time that gold and silver didn't enter because of the war. So the transitory shock become insolvent. And as takeaways of this, well, some money is still need some governance, take the technology underlying money as advanced in the digital era, yet the economics have not. And as a takeaway, remember, a rigid stable coin was poorly sweet in the 17th century to serve as a oil of the oil the payment system. And an elastic stable coin might affect confidence. And today is the modern central bank which have explicit support by the fiscal authorities that provide a modern, uh, a robust system also flexible. 
So the confidence in some sense is backed by taxpayers nowadays, and this brings some questions about stable coins or private stable coin, or uh, uh, in particular, how stable are they, and should they be regulated uh, like other things? And let me be clear on this. In the case of a stable coin, in my opinion, technology is of a second order, but technology is important by itself today, has a particular role, and in particular the role of speeding the, 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 the transactions, the cyber risks, and also the interlinks, interlinks be, between uh, different things. <clears throat> so I have talked about behavioral biases, about the role of technology. Let me say something about innovation and also news. And let me use the case of uh, Sean Law for that. Sean Law brings to France a lot of economics ideas. Again, a fruitful terrain because the economy was depressed, uh, the debt was high, there were high taxes, and in the upside, France controlled the colony of Louisiana. So a lot of economic ideas, like stimulate the economy by ab abolishing some taxes, set up state-owned monopolies, uh, uh, establish the Banque Générale, who replaced gold by fiat paper money. And these innovations could work or not. Let's uh, talk about a little bit about the Bank General. The bank issued paper money. Um, initially, it was a, a strict control that paper money had go back, back in. And the bank will finance the recent, Philippe de Orléans. And French people like paper money a lot. So it was uh, an innovation that made happy several stakeholders uh, in a particular situation where some kind of hill was needed to recover the, the, the economy. But importantly, all this uh, scheme, all this bank uh, thing gave Sean Law the possibility of increase the, the scheme, new, new schemes. So enters the Mississippi Company in 1717 with a monopoly right to trade with Louisiana colonies. And these uh, territories were French territories of which French knew little about. Most French people at the time didn't know where Louisiana was. And again, the lack of knowledge paves the way for a strategic, a strategic use of information. The funding was uh, really clever something like a complex and interconnected scheme, initially making uh, happy several stakeholders, as I, I said, and with little, little knowledge about what innovation and what the scheme was about. So all the scheme have a big expansion. The Bank General become the Bank Royale. Paper money become legal tender. Uh, the crowd uh, further guarantee the banknote issue. Maybe they uh, take the, the, the lesson from the Bank of Amsterdam, so the sovereign was behind the bank. <coughs> and the company expanded a lot, with the result that uh, only two years after established, uh, the dividends was of 40%, something huge for the time. So the key ingredients here are more innovation, more complexity, innovation with complexity, with more interlinks, and also fake news or fake uh, rumors, because uh, the publicity was there is gold, there is silver in Louisiana. But of course, two nice dividends, 40%, while were deemed dim too high. Uh, relate to the revenues of the company, so start some rumors about the inexistence of the mines in Louisiana, and some uh, people start to withdraw, uh, run on the company. So the panic uh, 
um, expanded, and the Bank Royale was liquidated, the stock, the stock market closed, and a profound uh, crisis become on also on the government and on the lack of uh, trust. Take away historical, historically financial innovation has been observed together with big financial trouble, and let me stress together, that does not imply causality in, in, in my opinion. And in particular, when the schemes are complex, highly interrelated activities, and there is lack of knowledge about the scheme and the risks. <clears throat> but uh, be aware of the other ingredients we have talked about. Overconfidence, positive contagion, herding behavior among, among investors, and, <clears throat> and also rumors and uh, fake news. Sometimes innovations are good and provide efficiency. Things, for example, in the case of paper money. But m sometimes a good thing, a good innovation, could be uh, bad for itself if, if bad implemented, like the case of the bank uh, of the Sean Law. Because after the Bank Royale fails, it takes 80 years for paper money to come back to the streets in France. Some words about uh, the role of fake news and rumors, and this is from 10 years ago in Bulgaria. Uh, it was a run in a corporate commercial bank. And after that, it happens that another bank, not related to the, to the, to the first run, was also <coughs> run. And one of the key explanations for that is a series of uh, fake anonymous emails, social media posts, and mobile phone messages saying that both banks were similar, and so the run precipitates from one to the other on the system very, very, very quickly. But uh, this is history, you know? And now things are different. We are doing things better than others. We have learned from other mistakes. This boom is... Uh, sound and it's based on fundamentals like uh, some uh, structural reform, technology and innovation, remember my, my words about that, and also financial understanding. And on the left, you have um, a press release that uh, was published just some weeks before the, the, the Great Depression start in 99, referring to Sean Law and referring that this time is different because people have good information about uh, the situation, and so uh, a stock crash was not possible. What happens less than one month after was the uh, Great Depression start. So overconfidence uh, again, and not considering that unhappy families are unhappy in their own way. Something like also disaster myopia, which uh, uh, refers that the thing that the longer the period since the last crash, the greater risk taking, and on the others, or the others, on the other hand, uh, should a crash occur, people tend to overweight recent uh, severe, severe events, making the recovery even more uh, difficult. I have some examples from the 30s. The fact was that the, the government was heavily in debt. People believe that uh, no more war and political stability, stability but the power explodes in uh, stock markets. In the 80s, uh, high commodity prices made happy a lot of Latin American countries with the belief that uh, banks that were lending were professionals and that the loans go to tangible things like infrastructures and, well, the prices of commodities um, collapse higher interest rates in the Western countries to fight inflation and a lot of crises and crashes in South America. In the 90s, the Asian crisis. In the 2007, the global financial crisis are also some examples of this syndrome of this time is different. It is maybe 
not different. Let me conclude with some final thoughts, like uh, a takeaway. Financial stability events are correlated to uh, lack of regulation, lack of supervision and control, over indebtedness, innovation, in particular when is, uh, it comes together with increasing complexity and uh, interlinks and behavioral biases. And materialize when there is lack of confidence or the information uh, <coughs> crystallized in some manner. Where are we? Well, we are with recent scars, that, like the global financial crisis, the European debt crisis, Brexit, COVID-19, the invasion of Russia, Russia to Ukraine. Uh, with responses to that, uh, rates, interest rates were low for long. Uh, there is a big increase in central banks' balance sheets and also bold response to some events like the Silicon Valley Bank in the, in the previous year, which might be explained, in my opinion, by this recent scars plus a geopolitical situation that uh, was needed in some sense to prevent some financial troubles uh, in the country. Of course, there is growing activities outside the regulatory perimeter. There is uh, increasing interlinks with the regulated activities. Uh, speedy innovation, and in particular, uh, the risk that came with uh, this innovation about severe security, severe crime, and also the response uh, of central banks on digital, uh, digital money, and also the possibility of uh, some kind of digital bank run. The different things here is speed. Uh, technology permits to do it with a click in, in a button. Financial vulnerabilities in the real and the financial sectors uh, in some countries, developed countries in particular, there are large debt at floating rates. This brings uh, to Manuel's uh, points of interest rate and liquidity. <coughs> Risk, also high public debt in several countries. Uh, geopolitical fragmentation, we have talked a lot this morning and a lot uh, more is need to, to, to be talked, and this digitalization with the RESO. Uh, there are several elements, in my opinion, that have been correlated to financial instability events on the past, plus rapid innovation, plus uh, changes in customers' preferences, to plus ha huge financial interlink in an increasingly uh, politically fragmental, uh, fragmented uh, war, but uh, with uh, a lot of interlinks in the financial sector. So, in my opinion, there is a, a, a narrow financial stability uh, corridor uh, through which uh, authorities uh, should, should manage uh, in these times. So, uh, with this, thank you very much. Thank you for taking us back in time and leading us through such an interesting journey with financial stability. We would like to open the discussions for questions from the audience. If we have any. <laughs> well, it looks like you answered all the questions that there, there might have been. OK, we have one. <coughs> Thank you, Matthew Williams, Franklin Templeton. Uh, history sometimes repeats, but it also rhymes. What do you think the next significant uh, instability will be in our economic history? And how do we avoid it? Easy question, eh? <laughs> Thank you for it. I have no idea. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of things going together. There is a lot of information, a lot of things we have learned. And we as, as authorities, as supervisors, as regulators. Uh, but uh, problems will repeat the same way itself. So maybe the challenge, some of them are uh, more traditional. Debt, without the, the, the most stable financial system is this financial system that didn't exist. 
It's completely stable. But uh, without debt, you cannot provide good things to society. So the thing is the balance between the two things, when debt is uh, too high, or uh, currency mismatches, or liquidity risk, this is a traditional. And this could be um, increase with the surrounding situation and dynamic of it. Like, well, inflation in the developed world, rise of interest rate that were uh, low for long. So there are a lot of things to take care about in the, in, in, in the calibration of the things. Could be mistakes for that. Plus uh, fragmentation and geopolitical things between big uh, parts of, of the world. So all this is most, most traditional. On the new things, Bitcoin, stablecoin, big tech, fintech, and so on and so forth, there are things that are also traditional. We can learn from past events as I try to, to, to focalize today. There are unknowns, and as Thorsten this morning said, unknowns, unknowns. So on that, um, technology could bring a lot of interesting things, uh, of course. In some sense, in some part, are of second order related to the economics behind that. And we are professional, uh, supposed to be professional on, on, on assessing this, this uh, part. On the other part, of course, uh, technology could bring speed to things cyber risks of which I know nothing about. Uh, last month at Sembla, we were talking about um, quantum computing and the power of quantum computing for the good, but also to break passwords and so on and so forth. And so we have to take care of, of, of that part. I mean, technology is of second order in economics, but by itself could bring things. And of course, in the middle of a fragmented uh, war can be used to, uh, to as, a, as a weapon in some in some sense. So these are my my, my thoughts, more or less. I, no, no, no precise answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Going back to the uh, your historical comparisons, when you showed the slide and we're talking about the Bank of Amsterdam and the, the, your stablecoin analogy, what kept going through my mind was Domingo Cavallo's convertibility plan. And, and I know how you like to look south across the river plate and admire the genius of the Argentine people. Um, it, it, the convertibility plan really was like that, wasn't it? There would be a dollar in the central bank for every peso in circulation. What went wrong there? The case of Asia was also uh, a peg to our currency. In Uruguay, we live in a country, a dollarized country, uh, law by law. And why? It's, uh, nowadays, it's something cultural in some sense, because uh, we save in US dollars. And we lose a lot of money saving in US dollar because uh, the, our currency appreciates. But we suffer in the 1982 a crisis. And there was a currency mismatch, mismatch on banks. So a lot of banks fail and a lot of people fail with banks. So we start to uh, uh, take in the, the US dollar to, to save, and it came 2002, another crisis. The banks were uh, much, but uh, firms were not. So credit risks, uh, exchange rate risk become credit risk. So we learn through time, but uh, we are uh, dollar dependent. The same for Argentinians. And today, Argentinians are maybe Bitcoin dependent because they cannot do most operations with US dollars and they don't believe in uh, a currency which is 100% uh, inflation and so on and so forth. Even they dollarize it. 
I am not in a position to, <laughs> to advise Argentinians to that, but uh, was wow. one was was <laughs> no, sorry, was one of the of the proposal by President Millet. Yeah, but you lost the sovereignty on your currency. You lost the monetary policy. You pegged to the Fed in some sense. You, you gained credibility, but you lost one important tool. We, Uruguay, are a dollarized economy, and we don't uh, dollarize uh, the economy uh, by law, in the sense that we pursued an independent monetary policy with inflation targeting, and we have been uh, a bit success. Uh, in the in the last time. Very brief. Thank you, Jorge. Very interesting presentation. I, I was, I must say, very tempted to also invite you to look across the River Plate and uh, draw some conclusions, uh, uh, particularly being from a country that tries to learn from history and having this neighbor that tries to <coughs> keep quite stick to history without changing it. Uh, but that said, uh, so Uruguay, if, if you look at the recent decades, uh, three, four decades in the past, there were at least two, two major crises, if you correct me if I'm wrong, one is, is the, the emerging market crisis in, in 82, or at least in the early 80s, and then the one uh, that coincides obviously with, the, is it triggered and coincides with, with the Argentine crisis in, in 2002. Other being at the central bank in, in, in a small open economy like Uruguay, and I think there are a few countries that represent the concept of, of, a, of a small open economy so well like Uruguay, mm -hmm. what have been the lessons from these two crises? So, and, and, and have been there any specific uh, changes in the, in the institutional framework, particularly in the realm of the, of the central bank, that have prevented the crisis like, like those two to, to repeat themselves? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, after a big instability events appear, and this is not only in Uruguay, it's in general, uh, a lot of changes in that This is the moment to convince politicians to make amendments in the laws, in the, in the charter of the central bank, the regulator, and so on and so forth. And a lot of uh, uh, changes happens in the following years to a, a crisis. Uh, of course, you are looking at the most recent event, and remember, unhappy families are unhappy in, in their own way. So it is important to go back to fundamentals and try to do things thinking in some kind of um, technology agnostic thing, no? so trying to go to the deep risk of the things. Of course, after 82, we learned some things. Banks were match in the balance sheet. But the risk was on the firms. Firms were not. Of course, we learned from that, and now <laughs> we control that more carefully. After 2002, which was related at the same time of the Argentinian crisis and, and, and Domingos Caballos' uh, convertibility plan, uh, but uh, we, we had our own mistakes in home. I mean, it was... Uh, no, supervision and regulation was not strong enough, and then we learn from that, and we um, improve uh, supervision and regulation in the following years. The banking system consolidates after the crisis, and then we face 2007, 2008 with better regulation, with few interlink, international interlinks, and with a more um, solid a banking system, and we pass this crisis uh, without uh, much problem. Of course, we learn from the crisis, and again, even though we didn't suffer from the global financial crisis as other uh, jurisdictions, we improve our uh, safety net, financial safety net, uh, becoming them a uh, financial stability net in some sense including some financial stability committee and improving the institutions to do that. But of course, this is a, a, a continuous. You learn from recent events and the tendencies to overreact and to uh, put a lot of focus on these events, but it's important to have uh, an eye also uh, with the lens in the past events has to inform. Like for example, what happens with uh, virtual assets and what is different about virtual assets from previous financial things and what is not uh, in, in order to regulate them 
adequately in the technology part, but also in what is the fundamental risk behind that. So yes, we, we, this is a continuing effort that uh, we, we, we should do. Thank you very much.